Hello and welcome to India's World. Nepal promulgated its secular, democratic and republican constitution on September 20th, after a decade-old struggle to do so. Instead of welcoming the development wholeheartedly and upset India, only noted the event in a terse statement. India has been one of the major backers of the democratization process in Nepal since the first Jan Andolan of 1990. It also lent its support to Jan Andolan II of 2006, which saw one of the biggest Maoist insurgencies in the region enthusiastically embracing the democratic process. However, today India is visibly upset with the new constitution. It is seen by the people of Nepal's Tarai, the Tharus and the Madhesis as further marginalizing them and denying them their rightful share in political power. India has publicly urged Nepal to make the constitution broad-based and inclusive. India is also concerned that the violence spurred by the rejection of the constitution by the Tharus and the Madhesis could spill over into India. India shares a 1,751-kilometer-long, totally porous border with Nepal. India's public position on Nepal's constitution has angered the Nepalese hill elite who dominate the country's politics. They see their own Tarai citizens as India's fifth column. The net result is that India-Nepal ties have hit a new low. To discuss this further, we have with us a distinguished panel of experts. We have with us Ambassador Rakesh Sood. He was India's ambassador to Afghanistan and Nepal, of course. He was also India's permanent representative to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva, an expert on Nepal affairs. Professor S.D. Muni, he's a professor emeritus at Jawaharlal Nehru University and has also taught at the National University of Singapore. He knows the entire Nepalese leadership. There is no better Nepal expert in India than him. And we have with us Mr. Shadri Chari, an eminent journalist and commentator. He's executive director at the Forum for Strategic and Security Studies, but more importantly, he's chief of the BJP's foreign affairs cell. I welcome you gentlemen to this discussion. Uh, Master Sood, let me begin with you. Having supported the constitution-making process in Nepal, why does India suddenly find itself in a situation where whatever New Delhi says is seen as interference in the internal affairs of Nepal? The India-Nepal relationship is an extremely close relationship. But alongside, it is also an extremely complex relationship. We have seen in the past also that every time there is a certain attempt at Nepali nationalism resurgence, it gets very easily interlinked into anti-Indianism. So in that sense, I think it has always been necessary that in the neighborhood, particularly when dealing with a sovereign state like Nepal, which has its own sensitivities, we have to be mindful of that. And therefore, we both have to walk softly, talk softly, but at the same time, ensure that our interests, concerns are registered and managed appropriately. Professor Buni, so what has gone wrong? Have we not talked softly? Uh, have we not talked gently to each other? Would you say that despite its Hindutva ideology, which the BJP government thought would bring them closer to the Nepalese people, because Nepal traditionally has been a, a Hindu Rashtra, that this policy has not been much of a success? You know, no Rudra Bhishek, no donation of... Uh, sandalwood or desi ghee to Pashupatinath temple has uh, worked wonders for this government? Well, I, I don't know if uh, Hindu strategy is the right strategy for Nepal to begin with. Secondly, uh, the government tried its best to convey the message in as many um, sophisticated ways as possible. As you said, uh, Prime Minister Modi during his two visits met all the stakeholders told them what India would prefer. Uh, then uh, Sushma Swaraj wrote a statement. Prime Minister spoke to the Prime Minister. Jai Shankar was sent it. Not that message was not communicated. But, you know, but my feeling is that we woke up very late. In fact, I have seen uh, India's policy unfolding in three stages. There was one stage when we said, hands off, we don't want to do anything, let the Nepalese decide. And we assumed that Nepalese would decide what uh, I think everybody prefers. It didn't happen. The second stage came when we said any constitution is better than no constitution. Therefore, we let Mr. Gachdar be parted away from the Tarai people and we let these uh, dominant uh, groups decide what the parameters of constitution should be. The third stage became a panic stage when suddenly we realized that they, they pushed through the uh, constituent assembly almost 270 articles in one day and and we just didn't know what will happen 
So I think it was lack of foresightedness on our part. We should have sustainedly worked with the Nepalese, knowing their political permutations and combinations, their power sharing, their posturing, their uh, what you call pent up uh, perceptions about India, whatever else it is. We probably could do better. Shishadri, you represent the BJP. Now, were you uh, cognizant of uh, what Professor Muni calls the pent up uh, uh, passions of the Nepalese about their nationalism? Uh, were there any issues you think that uh, India antagonized the Nepalese leadership on by pressing them too hard on some issues? No, <clears throat> we never pressurized them on any of these issues. But basically what has happened was the kind of monitoring that we should have been doing, at least in the last, say, a month or so. Because we had, as uh, Professor Muni suggested, we had told them that, look, this is the parameters of the constitution that you are making. It's very good. And we also said that any constitution is better than no constitution because from that point of view, you can always amend the constitution. If India is amended in 90 times, you can do it 900 times if you want. That's a different story. The other issue was about uh, federal structure. So that also we granted. We said, yes, if you think it is right, you do it. But, but when they came up with the absolutely absurd citizenship laws, and then barring a huge 40-50% uh, of the population from holding any high post. I mean, what happens to the present president of Nepal if he quits? He will not be able to contest again because he is a Madeshi. He will have to prove, prove his parentage and link it to Nepalese. To that extent, if the Nepal constitution goes, and then you come to know it only on the 20th of September or 17th of September, you did not know it on 17th of August. It's very sad. So I think, I think we are to blame here. Okay. It's not that we don't have to take any blame, but the blame that we should take is in the last few days and weeks of the constitution-making process, we somehow sat back and relaxed. So, uh, uh, Rakesh, so is this because of this big, big brotherly attitude that the Nepalese accuse us of? We think that once we have told them, do this, they will do it. And if they haven't done it, then we say, oh, we should have monitored it. You've been ambassador there. Do you think Indian behavior in Nepal of diplomats, of uh, uh, politicians, uh, leaves much to be desired? I think that what has happened in the past very often is that we have ignored public anti-Indianism or public expression of anti-Indianism by Nepal's political leaders because they would privately come and tell us whether to the ambassador there or to the political leaders in Delhi, they have to do this, they have to do this wink, wink, nudge, nudge kind of an approach. And then they would go back and engage in that anti-Indian public posturing. And as a result of this, there is a certain narrative of anti-Indianism which has gained ground. Now, this is a long-term thing that I believe we need to address very seriously. But coming back to the current situation that we were talking about, I think the signs were already visible. You know, Prime Minister Modi went there last year in August. It was such a successful visit. Everything he said ev was responded to positively by every section of Nepali society. You know, whether across the political spectrum from Pahar to Himal to Madhes and all the rest of it. Then when he went again for the Sark summit in November, he made exactly the same comments about the inclusiveness and consensus and so on. But at that time, there was a section of Nepali media which criticized Prime Minister Modi's statement. Some of them said, this is an unwarranted interference in Nepal's internal affairs. Now, yep. that should have been the warning sign. Yep. Because what happens is, every time there is internal political polarization in Nepal, Indian policy becomes the punching bag. All right. We, we'll discuss this further, but we need to take a break at this point. Don't go away. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're discussing the sudden dip in India-Nepal relations. Uh, Professor Muni, who do you think is formulating India's Nepal policy? We All of us seem to know what has gone wrong. But do those people who formulate policy, do they know what has gone wrong? I mean, who is it who formulates it? Is it the foreign office? Is it the intelligence agencies? 
It is the prime. Is it the prime minister's office, or is it some freelancer politicians who claim to represent the Indian establishment? Is it the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh? You'll pardon my or asking. Is it, or uh, is it Dr. Muni? Or is it Dr. Muni? <laughs> as he says. Well, you are asking me a question which is completely outside my territory, because I have never been uh, brought into framing Nepal policy. But you are an observer. Come, you are an observer of come, Nepal come, policy. Come to the point. Uh, I think the the final product comes out of approval from the PMO. There is no uh, no uh, um, no misunderstanding on this count. But the problem of the PMO is that there are too many conflicting, divergent stakeholders around. You know, I I I, I can recall many situations in which businessmen will go and appeal with the PMO, army will go and appeal with the PMO, those who are married into Nepal will go and appeal uh, to the PMO. Commerce Ministry have one point. Intelligence agencies would have one point, and collating all these diverse uh, inputs, and and Nepalese would come themselves either under the pretext of going to medical institute or doing anything else. They will come and then pass on the word. But shouldn't this be done by uh, the Foreign Office? Why have a Foreign Office uh, uh, if the PMO is going to be the nodal point for uh, bringing in all the information, analyzing it? You want to say something, Bharat? I mean. I would add to what Dr. Muni is saying. Nepal is, as I have already said, a very close relationship and a very complex relationship. And uh, all these elements, visiting Nepali politi political leaders, people intermarried, and intelligence agencies inputs, foreign policy inputs, all of this, they are all brought together and as is only appropriate, the final decision on Nepal or a policy on Nepal is crafted at the highest political level, what is called the Cabinet Committee on Security. And uh, papers are presented, consolidated papers, which take into account all the inputs, but it is at that level that the policy is approved. Okay. And, and you know, Chari, as somebody married into Nepal, no, <laughs> I, I, you should I, have your say. No, I don't think those that category of people give any advice to the prime minister Sir, uh, but, but 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 the the issue is the issue is you know the, ultimately the decisions have to be taken by the prime minister's office mm -hmm. number one mm -hmm. number two this has always been right from pandit jawaharlal nehru down to narendra modi the prime minister's office has been the nodal agency as far as the final decisions on any foreign policy issue is concerned particularly but, neighbors uh, particularly the neighbors yes but but it, it does not, it should not prevent the Prime Minister's office or the Foreign Office for that matter from getting as much information as possible. But, but there must always be a sort of a coordination between our embassy in Kathmandu and the MEA here through and the Prime Minister's office should take cognizance of all this. Why, why I am saying this again is that I think in the last uh, few weeks of the constitution making, our, our emphasis was more on yeah. the yeah. making of the constitution, yeah. promulgating it, and then bringing a situation to normalcy. Yeah. That was probably our concern. Yeah. We should have gone into a little more of yeah. the details okay. as far as at least these five or six contentious issues All were right. concerned. Uh, Professor Muni, uh, do you think that, yes, the Prime Minister began with a neighborhood policy, a regional approach, and so on and so forth. But Given the government's electoral promises of bringing in more investments, creating jobs, manufacturing, make in India, uh, led it to focus more on those countries which can deliver on these things, you know, uh, Europe, America, Japan, China. And in the process, what you were saying about the neighborhood just remained at the level of slogans. Absolutely correct, because there is a huge ad hocism in our policy, not only towards Nepal, but yeah. most of the neighbors, yeah. I would say. Yeah. I would say it here because, let me tell you, as yeah. uh, Ambassador Su said, that, you know, uh, many people come and Nepalese leaders came, assured us. They, they told us something else, but could we not see what these people were talking to their own constituencies? I mean, even before the elections, the Nepali Congress and the UML was absolutely clear that they will not follow the agenda of new Nepal, yeah. that they would not have an inclusive constitution, that they will have only five or six provinces, that they will follow it north and south. Did we not know this? I mean, so, this was for so, everybody so, to it, realize. So, uh, Rakesh, is it our case that the Nepalese party leadership, uh, especially of the three big parties, misled us by saying that, look, we will take care of your concerns, and finally didn't, and that's why India's got angry, that, look, you lied to us, and that, you know, India was had. <laughs> 
to an extent yes but i think we must be honest enough to accept our own responsibility because as i pointed out we saw that when prime minister modi made the same statements in november yeah. there was a criticism so we could see the writing on the wall so we should have sensed and as i said the you know as internal polarization political polarization in nepal increases we have to be conscious because it's not the first time yeah. that we are seeing this uh, difficulty in india nepal relations we've seen it in the past yeah. many times and i think when we saw uh, vijay gachhedar who is a tharu madhesi leader you know initially in june uh, he was party he was a signatory to the 16 point agreement and which was a good thing because it is yeah. always possible that no, not all madhesis so, so will come in so he finally left and but then he left the speculation that no, he may I, join again but and at that point it was very clear that polarization had gone yeah. increased hugely okay. no, we, we need to take a break at this point we'll be back again in a bit uh, stay with us don't go away the discussion is getting heated up and interesting Welcome back. We're discussing the dip in India-Nepal relations. Shishadri, you wanted to say so, something. Uh, see, I don't agree with this issue that the Prime Minister's office has gone wrong somewhere and all these things. The Prime Minister is expected to be concerned about so many other issues that are facing the country, and we have been sorting it out. But what is more important is we have an MEA which has a long experience, which is a highly structured organization. It has very many layers of uh, decision-making process. and i think it it will not it will be very wrong to fault the mea of having gone wrong somewhere here but so who i has think gone i wrong? think the prime minister's no, office hasn't no, gone no, wrong no, no. mea hasn't that. gone wrong it's not that what Why what has the happened is the indian embassy they can only no, send reports it's not the question of just sending the reports the indian embassy is not just supposed to send the reports they are supposed to do what has been told to okay. told by them and it has they have to go by the agenda that was set and that is what they have not done that is okay. what i have right. my concern let, is uh, professor moin let me ask you this how valid are the concerns of india that the tarai violence can overflow into india why would agitation against nepal's constitution which is you know the center of it is in kathmandu why should that violence come to india uh, uh, or is uh, are we saying this for the uh, heck of it and or because there is a bihar election uh, there no no the concerns are not totally invalid let me quote uh, pn haksar he said so far as neighbors are concerned we are lodged into each other's intestines and nepal is lodged right in the center of our intestines there is no doubt about that but let me come back to the indian policy you know we are used for the last 50 years of dealing only with the power brokers either here or there it is time that we change this style because it's a different nepal it's a new nepal people are aware there people have awoken there they it's a, it's a democratic nepal it's not the monarchical nepal that you deal with half a dozen people and everything will get going and unfortunately indian diplomacy and policy has not been able to cope with this change which has taken okay, place okay let rakesh uh, reply to that charge because uh, the point is it's not as if indian diplomacy has uh, dealt only with the monarchy there have been phases where there have been democratic Very leaders in fact, people who want to become prime ministers first come to delhi to get an endorsement collect their bag full of money and go back and try and become prime ministers so you tell me is it failure of indian diplomacy of not i am not commenting on your bagfuls of money and delhi's endorsement but all i would say is that i think at times of significant political change in nepal whether in 1950 51 whether in 1990 or whether in 2005 6 when the maoist insurgency came over ground and a peace process uh, was instituted india has been able to play an important role now today's world is very different from what it was 50 years ago i mean it's in media driven globalizing world so obviously we need to be a little less visible than perhaps we were in 1950s okay. Okay. and a policy however sound ultimately its success depends on how well it is implemented yeah. okay sheshadri now that government of india has taken a public position on its objections to the current nepalese uh, constitution how easy or difficult would it be india would it be for india to backtrack and if india does not backtrack is india in a position to get all those suggestions implemented in nepal no i don't i don't think we need to backtrack we have uh, given our apprehensions uh, to the nepali political leaders and i think there is a 
clear awareness among a number of political leaders there. The Maoists have very categorically said that there something has gone wrong in this. The Nepali Congress has passed a resolution saying that we will look into all these issues and they have also sided with the Madeshis. Why should we and don't trust remember, them now when we no, didn't no, trust them earlier remember, and they've no, gone no, back no, on whatever See, politicians say. are politicians everywhere. Don't forget the fact that Madeshis are a very big vote bank. So no political party in Nepal would also like to antagonize the Madeshis to this extent. Therefore, I think this issue will get resolved. Therefore, to say that it's a new low and then the relationships have gone to such an extent it's a point of no return and all that, I don't think Nobody's so. Nobody's saying that. I don't but, think so. But let I, think, I think we will overcome this and with the help of the Nepalese political establishment itself, we will overcome these issues. Okay. Professor Munip, uh, do you agree with him that we will overcome this with the help of the current establishment? You know, just because they'll suddenly see reason? Or do you think that the, uh, the Pahari leadership uh, that dominates these political parties will continue to be intransigent? And my secondary question is, if they continue to be intransigent, do you see the Madesi uh, agitation, Madesi sub-nationalism or nationalism inching towards an insurgency? Well, I don't think sub-nationalism should uh, come up or even anybody should encourage it because that is against the contrary to the contrast of Madeshis uh, themselves. So far as the present situation is concerned, I think it will, I go with Mr. Seshadri, that eventually it will settle down. Because as I said, the stakes on both the sides are very high. And we cannot afford to, you know, remain alienated from each other for a long time. I think this is a phase of uh, genuine gross misunderstanding and misassessment. Mm -hmm. Something uh, the Pahari leaders will have to uh, be nudged to and, and compromise. And I think to some extent even Madesh will have to make compromises in what their position is and that is possible. Okay. Now, uh, you know, do you think India's support for inclusiveness is seen by the Madesi people as India's backing for them? So would it make the Madesi leaders more intransigent or more flexible? So what needs to be done really? Well... One of the reasons why the Madesis were not very successful in the whole run-up to this constitutional thing was that the Madesi movement had also fractured from about three parties seven years ago when the constitutional drafting exercises began in 2008. Today there are more than a dozen Madesi parties. So as a result, they, their voice lacked coherence. I think that uh, if the main three political parties, the Nepali Congress, UML and Maoists, if their leaders sort of step back a little yeah. and come down from their hardened positions, I think the Madesis will also step forward and compromises, political compromises okay. should be possible. Okay. On that happy note, we've really run out of time, so I'd like to thank all of you, Mr. Sheshadi Chari, Professor S.D. Muni, Ambassador Rakesh Sood for... Thank you participating in this discussion. That is all we have for you today. We'll be back again next week as usual. Till then, goodbye and thanks for watching India's World.